Welcome to Dispatch Faith. I'm Michael Renault, one of the editors here at the Dispatch and the editor of the Dispatch Faith newsletter. And I'm really excited to have here today Jake Meter, who is the editor in chief of the Christian journal Mere Orthodoxy, and uh, is a writer and author and speaker. And his most recent book that came out a couple of years ago is What Are Christians For? Jake, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so let's just jump right in. Uh, a few weeks ago, Jake, you wrote an essay that we featured in the Dispatch Faith newsletter, um, really trying to unpack the post-liberalist movement or post-liberalism movement, particularly among um, religious writers and religious thinkers on the American right. And I think you did a service for a lot of folks, me included, in just helping us see the through line from where a lot of religious conservatives were 10 years ago and uh, where they are now and how bigger picture ideas about what society is and what community is and how to live in a culture that sometimes brushes up against um, our own notions of, of the good life, I think is the way you put it in a couple of places in the essay, but how that, how that brushes up against where we are now in the political realm as well. Um, so just wanted to, talk through some of the points you bring up in the essay, but I guess just to start off, to do a little bit of level setting, the term post-liberalism um, gets used a lot in the essay. Uh, you refer to that a lot. You refer to liberalism a lot. Let's just unpack a little bit um, what you mean by those terms, what you're referring to, if you don't mind. Yeah, the devil's always in the details with that, because everybody has slightly different ideas in their head of what those terms mean. And I've, I personally have pulled back a little bit from describing myself as post-liberal, actually, in the last few years for a bunch of reasons. But maybe the way to start is that the, the post-liberal conversation really is an academic conversation that's happening 40 years ago at Yale. And it's happening because of figures like George Lindbeck, Hans Fry. If I say names wrong, you'll have to forgive me because I just encounter them in reading. <laughs> I might butcher some names. Stanley Hauerwas would be part of that. Alistair McIntyre gets roped in. Who else would be there? Well, interestingly, like Rusty Reno, who edits First Things, was at Yale at that time. So mm -hmm. he was, I don't remember who he studied with, but all these folks are, so this is happening at Yale in the 80s, and it's happening in the Divinity School mostly as various sorts of Christians are kind of reckoning with what's already clearly a failing mainline and a lot of breakdown in political life in the U.S. even back then. Because if you think about it, like Howard Wass, some of his more radical anti-liberal stuff is being published in the 70s and 80s. Um, somebody like McIntyre is moving in those circles around the same time. So in that respect, it's an old conversation. And if mm -hmm. you want to really get to the, the start of it, you probably need to go back to McIntyre, Howard Wass, Lindbeck, that whole scene. Um, in the conservative media political discourse of the last 10 years, what's really been happening is a lot of those ideas have had enough time to filter out into popular media and also the social dynamics that were apparent to people in the academy in the 80s have also had time to continue to develop such that it's becoming very apparent to a much larger group of people that there are some breakdowns happening in america's civil society and common life the Death, death of the mainline is a huge factor in this. Uh, jo Joseph Jody Bottom has a great book on this called um, Anxious Age that I highly recommend. And so by the time you get to the mid 2010s, there's this sense of liberalism as this governing social theory for American life as having failed in some way. And now the problem becomes, well, what do you mean by liberalism? Do you mean the entire system of like classical liberal rights dating back to the enlightenment do you mean certain parts of the american constitution and american civic order do you mean the civic order that emerged after world war ii um, under eisenhower and carrying forward and everybody uses these terms in slightly different ways um, the the way I've taken to talking about it more, because I think it's more targeted, um, is to talk about the specific kind of globalized 
free trade liberal liberal democratic system that's emerged since the 50s onward that's what i've had in view more in the last several years when i'll talk about liberalism because the thing is if you pull back further than that you start saying things that i hope you don't actually want to say because if you want to just throw out liberalism in total all the way back to the enlightenment okay are we doing just right-wing strongman politics are we doing like maoism or stalinism because if you toss out liberalism that comprehensively i mean we only have so many theories <laughs> of politics and mm -hmm. social order in the modern world and if liberalism in all its forms and variants is bad and has to be dispensed with okay but then what like this has been and i think i'm actually did a little video for the Miro YouTube when I was playing with that about this with Professor Deneen. Because Deneen is an interesting one in as much as he's been extremely resistant to a lot of the kind of pagan stuff creeping in on the right now around figures like Bronze Age pervert. And he's also been pretty resistant to strongman style politics. Um, regime, regime change is not a great book, but it's not a manifesto for dictatorship by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And yet, I, I think the the current state of the integralist is kind of indicative of the problem in that they said all liberalism is bad. They box themselves into a corner. And I think most of them are too personally virtuous to just say, okay, we're not doing liberalism. We're not on the left. So I guess we're stuck with fascism. The integralists mostly haven't wanted to make some have, but mostly they actually haven't. Uh, if you take someone like Sora Bomari, he's basically pulled back into Christian social democracy, which is fine. I'm, I'm on board with Christian social democracy, but that's a form of liberalism. It's actually a very mm -hmm. Protestant form of liberalism in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the very scattergun approach that was taken to defining liberalism didn't serve the conversation well because nobody knew exactly what was in view. And it led to some pretty, what I think rightly were regarded as out there political ideologies, um, suddenly looking more plausible to people because, well, liberalism has failed. So now what do we do? Um, but yeah. So, so then. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So then when you when you use a term like post liberalism in a piece like what we what we mm -hmm. published a couple of weeks ago, you're you're referring to post liberalism as kind of a more limited reaction to what we've seen in the last 70, 80 years. Is is that a is that a fair way to put it? Yeah. That that's how okay. I would want to use the term. Okay. So I mean, so you've kind of and I I do want to come back to some of the things that you uh kind of referred to there. But I mean, the beginning of your piece, you kind of drop us in this a uh, book launch event in 2017 in Manhattan um, with an interesting cast of characters, but um, they're, everybody's there, including you, are there to launch the book uh, written by Rod Dreher, um, who I think both you and I know personally, um, mm -hmm. The Benedict Option. And mm -hmm. uh, that's really, it's a starting point for the essay. You also backtrack a little bit to 2015 and the Indiana Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, which is signed into law by then Governor Mike Pence. <laughs> um, but you, you, I mean, you characterize these folks here, um, as all being interested in how to get at some of the social problems that were becoming more apparent, I guess, by 2017. Um, what were those folks trying to kind of conserve? I think, I mean, you wrote about that, um, you wrote about that event, but also just about the kind of the zeitgeist of the moment, mm -hmm. the goal of the media discussion uh, I'm quoting from you, was to find a way through the political morass created by expressive individualism and the erosion of given forms of belonging and meaning. Um, so unpack that for us. What what was this or what is this perhaps this expressive individualism look like and, and what has eroded? Yeah, so there's a lot of books all being written around that time. Rod's sold the best. I don't actually think it was the best, but um, there was Rusty Reno's resurrecting the idea of a Christian society, which I actually thought handled the issue better than Rods did. There was um, Archbishop Chapu had a book. Um, oh, gosh, what was it called? Strangers in a Strange Land, I think. Mm -hmm. There were a number of books 
in that kind of vein coming out at that time. That's also when I started working on my first book, though that one came out in 2019. And the thing that I think all of us were seeing in varying degrees was huge swathes of society getting left behind. Uh, a very kind of pervasive cruelty running through much of American life. And so in resurrecting the idea of Christian society, for example, uh, Reno is really focused on the poor, actually. And he's really focused on trying to recover solidi social solidarity as a way of lifting up the poor and improving the status of all Americans and the quality of our life together as a country. So you could look at that. I think a lot of these trends have just continued in the last 10 years. They've just gotten more pronounced because smartphones are now more entrenched and we know more about what they do. Uh, social media networks are more established and having their effect. TikTok wasn't a thing in 2015, for example. Mm -hmm. All right. But it was a, a sense that America was a very lonely place, a very anxious place. Um, for myself, I know concerns about the opioid crisis were also a big thing that was behind a lot of what I was trying to do at the time. And so there was a sense of something has failed in the way we live amongst each other as Americans. And at the time, nobody was thinking politics is going to fix this. Um, Rod was probably the most aggressive in stating that, but there was a pretty clear sense for most of us, maybe even all of us, I think, that politics are themselves so broken that it's going to be really hard to use political means to fix these things. It's going to be much smaller, simpler kinds of work. This is, of course, mm -hmm. something like the notorious ending of uh, Deneen's liberalism book that ev virtually every reviewer flagged at the time was, okay, you've got this withering critique of the entire system that governs our life for the first 90% of the book. And then the last 10% 10, 10 is this very limited, um, modest proposal for localism, basically. But I think what Deneen had was representative of where a lot of people were. There was a sense mm -hmm. that a lot of things have broken down and we don't really know what the big picture solution is. We know some small things that will help. And I mean, that's not something that's uh, that was a flash in the pan 10 years ago or eight years ago. The, the conversation has changed a little bit, but the same root issues are still there with um, there's been a lot of conversation about birth rates and why are fewer people having mm -hmm. children? Why are fewer people wanting to have children? Um, of course, the drug use issue and opioid addiction continues to be pervasive. Um, but you also, I think, have in the last few years, you've got books like um, An Anxious Generation, um, I think is is the correct title, Jonathan Haidt, um, mm -hmm. talking about problems with young adults and teens and adolescents. So um, these are, you know, pretty wide ranging generational sorts of issues. This isn't a flash in the pan uh, sort right. of issue that that was going on for a couple of years. Um so I guess to kind of so you've got you've got Rod Dreher's book, The Benedict Option, you've got the other the other works that you mentioned. They're focused on helping um I think you refer to them as communities of virtue in the essay, um, which can be religious communities, they can be, you know, things besides uh mm -hmm. religious communities too, but trying to figure out how to um how to make do, uh how to thrive, I guess, when when all this is going on. But then the conversation starts to turn in 2019, and you kind of pinpoint uh, maybe one of the turning points or the turning point. But um, what do you unpack on the essay there? Yeah, I think the, the turning point really was 2019 for me, because I remember even as late as the late, I think it was late summer 2018, we had an event out at Fox Hill, Bruderhof, where Plow is published. And we had, mm -hmm. I, I think And this, for those who are... Who, aren't familiar, Bruderhof, can you unpack that a little yeah, bit yeah. for folks? It's a radical Anabaptist community um, that lives from a common purse, so they don't have private property. They've adopted vows of nonviolence, um, obedience to the community. So if you think kind of a Protestant monastic order, but anyone can join, including whole families, that's the idea. And like young people, they kind of have like when kids are coming of age, they'll kind of do a room springer type thing. Um, so kids aren't 
presupposed to just be part of the Bruderhof by virtue of being born in it. They have to choose as adults, this is the life I want, and to join the community, take the same vows their parents did. They publish a magazine called Plow. Plow is actually a little older than the Bruderhof itself, interestingly. But we had an event out there in 2018, and Dalvit and Deneen were the two speakers. And I remember at the event, Leah Sargent was in the audience. She had written a book called Building the Benedict Option, which was a kind of community organizing guide for Christians trying to build up stronger, thicker communities. And she was in the audience and she asked both of the speakers to name one illiberal thing they had done in the past week. And Deneen's reply was that I go to mass every day in the chapel on campus at Notre Dame because I want my students to see me kneeling. I think it's important that my students know that I am not making things up as I go. I'm not in this because I like want to have political power or I want to control them. Uh, I respond to Christ and I teach what I teach and believe what I believe because it follows from what Christ teaches us. So like, that's 2018. So this is well into the Trump years. You still have these kind of groups coming together, still thinking in those terms. And then I think what happened was that in the summer of 2019, uh, Saurabh Amari, who I already mentioned, he wrote a piece for First Things, I think it was called Against David Frenchism. And it was a critique of David's very particular kind of civic libertarian, or I, I don't want to misrepresent him. That's happened enough to the poor guy. Um, but David has a fairly proceduralist libertarian sense of liberalism and how politics should work. I don't agree with him on this, but that's that's his view. And so that shaped how he wrote about everything going on in the Trump years and also everything going on as a lot of kind of great awakening stuff was ramping up. And so Sorab went after that basically as a kind of loser's ideology that just guarantees that the Christians are never going to win anything politically. We're just going to keep losing. We're going to keep becoming more marginal. And then when we've been completely routed, we're going to look around and wonder what happened. And mm -hmm. Well, we've been setting ourselves up to fail by believing in this metaphysically agnostic view of politics that left us completely impotent in public debate. So that was Sorb's argument, but he specifically linked all of this to David's opposition to, Fr or to Trump, and also, I think, to his own endorsement of Trump. And so it smuggled Trumpism into the post-liberalism discourse in a way it really hadn't been up to that point. Mm -hmm. And after that, a lot of the conversation starts to shift and it becomes much more a question of, um, well, we want to build these strong communities of virtue, but we know they don't have a prayer of surviving without political power to back them. So, there, there's actually, I had this very bizarre experience recently. Um, there's a far right guy, basically wants to be a warlord named Charles Haywood, um, who he's written about how he has this compound and only a direct military assault would be sufficient to take it. And he wants to have, I think he's calling them armed patronage networks hmm. of basically these kind of like semi feudal, highly rich people who can afford to host like well-armed men and their families on their compounds like that's his vision but when um, i read his he did a book review of leah's book and he actually really liked the book it's so bizarre to me he really liked the book but the tell was he said the problem with this book is it doesn't say anything about politics and if you don't have political might backing the communities that sergeant wants those communities won't be able to survive mm -hmm. and so that's the turn is when you say, well, all those communities of virtue are well and good, but the only way they can make it is if they have po political might behind them. Mm -hmm. And once you make that turn, the very existence of Christian families, Christian communities, all of these things has now been said to hang on whether or not political power is backing them. Yeah. Which, I mean, there's all kinds of theological and biblical problems with that, because I don't know how the early church survived for 300 years. 
or how many other churches survive for far longer without political power, sometimes with a great deal of political oppression. Think of the cops. Right. Um, but it also, it so centers political power that, okay, political power is now the non-negotiable thing we absolutely must possess for our communities to exist. And once you make that move, pretty much anything is in play if it's going to get you political power. And now to like, to Sorb's credit, he has been very, very clear in rejecting some of the more extreme applications of this idea, particularly coming from lots of Protestant Christians. And so I, I want to give Sorb credit for that. But I think he was the first really mainstream figure with a huge audience who made the possession of political power kind of a sin qua non of having virtuous communities. And once that idea was established, all bets are off as to where that can go. And that gets us into questions. I mean, we're, I mean, so the stuff that we're publishing at the dispatch is kind of always uh, to some degree or another coming back to that question. Um, but I know a lot of the stuff that you've written for Miro and elsewhere, that's a central question too, but the degree to which politics need to be part of the conversation. I mean, is it fair to say that kind of the, I guess, you know, to, to go back to your framework or conception of liberalism, that politics is part of the equation just insofar as it kind of holds the walls up to allow communities of virtue to be able to function through things like, you know, robust religious liberty or robust freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of keeping forces that would that would um you know erode that very thing at bay is is that a fair way to think about kind of the balance of political political power yeah. i mean just the way that we order our lives together that has to be part of the equation because we are social creatures mm -hmm. um yes but there are tough judgment calls about those balances right mm -hmm. yeah i'm not a quietist by any stretch i am not even a howard wassian who would say like the power of the state is inherently the power of the sword and must be rejected by Christians. Like, I'm not there at all. I think we overstate the um, kind of all-consuming role that politics plays in yeah. our life together in this country. We can also understate it. And so if somebody feels they have a call to serve in elected office, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if you're a Christian who wants to go into government and try to build up the life of the nation and the common good through public service, that's great. Um, but it's not the only way that we do that. There are all sorts of other things. Uh, one of the books that's really shaped me over the last couple of years is Jeff Stout's Democracy and Tradition. And what the way Stout talks about it is he really says liberalism isn't so much a political ideology as it is a political method. Mm -hmm. And it's a method that kind of describes the way America just works anyway. Um, as this kind of ongoing conversation between neighbors about any number of things as to how we shape our common life, many of which are not even going to be something that should ever come up in a legislative debate in the state capitol or in D.C. Um, so that would be one piece. And then I think the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that there are such things as bad victories. If you're a Christian, there is a way of seeming to win in exchange for giving up your soul. Like This is one of the main things Jesus warns his disciples about. If you gain the whole world but lose your soul, what does it profit you? Mm -hmm. And so there is a way of gaining political power. There is a way of gaining material security that will ruin you. And that's not because material security is bad. It's not because political power is bad. It's because the means you use to acquire those things are not neutral. Mm -hmm. And so there is a certain sense in which if you have a choice between behaving viciously and gaining security or power or behaving righteously and having a chance at losing, it is better to lose. And again, I'm not saying that we should try to lose. I'm not saying that, like, it's none of that. But it's just a recognition. Like, I think Jesus meant it when he said, there's a way of gaining the world that will damn you. And I want us and, to take that warning seriously. 
And I mean, not to not to sort of pile on or anything, but I think that's one part of the equation that I mean, if you read David French's work, for example, um, over the years, and then you read, you know, Amari, particularly in 2019, and there are different flavors of Sorab Amari, right? He's he's <laughs> kind of um, he's kind of undulated a little bit over the years on where he stands on certain things. But that's one of the chief criticisms of kind of that movement that formed, you know, starting in 2019 to take your to take your point is that idea that if you have to be vicious in order to attain mm-hmm. the political power which you seek, um, you've kind of lost the plot to begin with, right? Yeah, I guess. So I grew up in a fundamentalist church here in town, and it was the kind of church that was very confident that they were right about everything. And pretty sure that churches that didn't agree with them on even the smallest minutia it wasn't that they were wrong it wasn't that we disagreed with them it was that they probably aren't actually christian like that was the kind of spirit the thing that happens is when you build a community of people that work that way and think that way it, you're putting 20 angry vituperative people in a phone booth and expecting it to go well like as soon as their common enemy disappears, they're going to turn on each other. Or the other mm-hmm. thing I think about, there's a scene in Return of the King with Tolkien where Frodo and Sam are in Mordor and there's two orcs that are tracking them. And the orcs don't know that they've nearly discovered them. And so Frodo and Sam are watching them and the two orcs start bickering and then one kills the other. And Sam goes, says something like, well, if that spirit spread around, our job would be a lot easier, wouldn't it, Mr. Frodo? And Frodo laughs, but then is like, well, this is the spirit of Mordor, but they hate us way more than they hate each other. So if they had seen us, mm-hmm. they would have dropped their quarrel. But I, I think when you have, when you create a movement defined by anger, defined by anxiety, defined by a lot of fear, and that's what you win people with into the movement, okay, now you have a movement of people who are primarily motivated by anger, anxiety, and fear. Good luck building anything. I I don't know how you hold anything together when that's the spirit of the movement. And so I think that is, I can't can't know individual hearts. Um, I don't know personally most of the people in the integralist conversation, but from just online behavior, that seems to be what's happened there. And I think that will probably be what happens in the Christian nationalist space. And you get these very loud, belligerent, aggressive people together. And as long as they have a common enemy, they look pretty formidable. And then once, for whatever reason, that time of aiming at the common enemy winds down, well, now what? Right. (laughs) And suddenly all of the small disagreements between them. All right. And so you actually, it, that point you just made dovetails really nicely with kind of the, the, the narrative arc of your essay, too, just because after um, 2019 and things that happen the next couple of years, you do start to see the splintering among, you know, post liberals. You've mentioned the Catholic integralists who have a very kind of specific um, application of all this with regards to Roman Catholicism. Um, but then you have other movements among, you know, Protestants and others too. But you you address in the essay um, kind of how white nationalism gets also brought into the fray here. Um, there are all kinds of disagreements between national conservatives and others. Um, I would point people toward the essay, the Dispatch Faith essay, just to, <laughs> to see how you unpack all that a little bit more. Um, we're kind of winding down, so I, I want to try to land a couple planes here, I, I guess, if I can. Um, you you do end the essay on a moment of hope, and you do quote Tolkien, um, <laughs> refer back to Tolkien, um, which is very on brand. But uh, I mean, my my question is: so where so the the folks who still identify some of the same um, concerns and problems going on with American culture writ large or the West writ large um, that were occurring in 2015 or 2017 in certain ways, a lot of those the roots of those issues are still present. Um, religious communities or communities of virtue, as you put it, um, still have to answer some of these same questions about how do we be faithful to our call um, in these circumstances? Um, where, where, what would you direct those communities and those individuals uh, to look to or where to go? And then kind of a piggyback question, the term post-liberal, 
at least if you've if you uh, the way you've used it is is that does that term have any positive value anymore any like prescriptive value um or is that something that we should just kind of if, if you care about these issues should we just let that whole conception go by the wayside so i mostly steer clear myself of the post-liberal label at this point that said um Theopolis Institute, the kind of think tank organization run by Peter Lightheart out of Birmingham, they have kind of their own project of ecclesial post-liberalism that several of my friends are involved with. And I'm curious to see where that goes and how they develop that. Uh, they just had a book come out related to it. I haven't been able to pick it up and read it yet. Actually, I friend of mine here in Lincoln contributed a chapter to it. So I feel like I need to read it. Uh, so they're the ones that I think are most responsibly trying to rescue that project. And I, good luck to them. I think there's a lot of good people trying to do that. Um, as far as where people can look for better models going forward, the two thoughts that come to mind are, so first, uh, I, I'm reminded of a, there was a podcast an Australian pastor named Mark Sayers did a number of years ago where he was talking about the crisis of pastoral care in Australia. In his context, he's in Melbourne. And he actually got very emotional as he was talking about this particular news story he had seen that really moved him deeply. And he said, there are a lot of Christian leaders. He's, the podcast is kind of aimed at pastors and nonprofit leaders. Uh, there are a lot of Christian leaders who are very fatigued right now, and yet the need for pastoral care is greater than it's ever been, greater than it was five years ago. I shouldn't say greater than it's ever been. That's hyperbole. But it's, it's, it's significant. And what a lot of people need is very ordinary things that are just human. Uh, they they don't need a political revolution. They need someone to sit with them and look them in the eye and care about them. Really? Like, huge need right now. Something that simple. There's a, a line that Walker Percy has in The Moviegoer about the look that comes over a man's face when he realizes that you really do care about his business. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to that. Um, so I think for anyone, just trying to take an interest in the people that God has put around you, sincere interest in them, make yourself available to them. That alone could be quite revolutionary in your particular context, in your church community or your neighborhood. It's not radical stuff. The other thing that comes to mind is that I think you mentioned Heights work earlier. One of the gifts that we can have from his work, or this is another name I'm probably going to say wrong, Gene Twenge or Twenge, Twenge, sorry. Um, the two of them have done a lot of work on anxiety, conversation, just social life amongst American young people. And their work has created a much higher degree of awareness across the country about the tech mm -hmm. problems driving a lot of what we're seeing now politically. Now, the tech problems aren't everything. There's other issues, and those other issues are going to have answers that are going to be specifically Christian in many cases. But, I mean, even this week, uh, Lincoln Public Schools has started school this week, and now middle school and high school, they don't allow phones during the school day at all. Your phone has to stay in your locker. That wasn't something that was happening 10 years ago. So I think there's probably space now around this tech critique to be able to start doing some good work with people that are very unlike us to be able to say, okay, we might disagree on X, Y, and Z, but we can see what phones are doing in our community and let's figure out something we can do about them. So I, I've suggested several times at Miro that churches should start thinking about ways of going phone free on Sunday morning. And that could look different in every church context, but I think it's a conversation we should be having. Uh, mm -hmm. Small groups could be doing the same thing. How do we get these things out of the space so that we can just be with each other? And that's a conversation that a lot of non-Christians are also having right now. So that's 
just on a basic level, a chance to repair some civic friendships, I think, with people that are not like us and don't share our beliefs. Of course, as a Christian, you can also look at that and say there's an evangelistic opportunity here uh, that comes from a sense of disconnectedness. It comes from a sense of fatigue with the way we're being asked to live. I, ju I just finished reading Abigail Favale's Genesis of Gender, and she shares the story in the final chapter of this young woman who transitioned and then detransitioned. And as she was detransitioning, also became Catholic. Hmm. And one of the things that Favale identifies as a pivot for her was seeing herself as a creature rather than this kind of detached, autonomous thing. Mm -hmm. So I think the tech conversation also gives us a chance to try to once again figure out what does it mean to live as a human creature amongst our neighbors. And there's a lot of really fruitful places that could go. So it's not that we have to like abandon politics or like run for the hills or anything. I, I just want us to talk about other things as well. Sure. Um, Jake, thanks so much for taking the time to talk through this essay, but talk through these issues. If folks want to read more of your work or want to follow you, where should they go? Yeah, so I run Mere Orthodoxy, which is a Christian online magazine and journal. Uh, we're actually doing a membership campaign right now, so members will get uh, access to the print journal and then some other perks that we're slowly building out online. You know how these things go. Um, so mereorthodoxy.com would be one place to go. I technically still have a Twitter handle. I basically never use it anymore. And then I do have an email newsletter on button down that people can also sign up for. Great. Well, again, thanks for writing for us. Um, looking forward to the next time you do write for us. But <laughs> thanks for joining yeah. us today, too. So thanks very much. Thank yeah, thanks for having me.